Good morning. Uh, I'm Jim Indelicato with DC Velocity, and we're proud to be a media partner with Parcel Forum, putting on some of the tracks for them. And today, this morning, we have a case study, 3PL versus in-house distribution, what is right for your operation. And we have with us Melissa Curry from Cal Cartage, Robert Humphrey, and Michael Clemens from Bastion Solutions. And I believe um, Robert is going to start us. Morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so as a, uh, a brief introduction into our, our session here, um, this case study, third party logistics versus in house distribution, um, and what is going to be you know, some of the key, key uh, decision making criteria that needs to go into place um, when you're evaluating that. Um, <clears throat> so, this topic is uh, jointly provided by California Cartage Company and uh, Bastion Solutions. Um, Bastion Solutions were a material handling systems integrator and California Cartage is a third-party logistics provider. So between the two of us, we see different sides and different ends of that decision-making um, process. And we, Bastion Solutions, we've been very fortunate to um, have worked with California Cartage Company on a, a handful of different projects where they were selected as the um, third-party logistics provider for the, the shipper. So <clears throat> with regards to this being a case study, uh, unfortunately, we can't get into a lot of project specifics, a lot of uh, uh, details about the various um, systems that we've done together. But we put our heads together and really evaluated a lot of the, the key decisions that had to go into it and, and find a lot of similarities across those projects um, and really have built a, a proxy to what uh, this case study topic will be. Um, so we're hoping that it'll be very informative. Um, just briefly here, a couple of housekeeping topics. Um, if you have the Parcel Form app, uh, check into the session. Uh, helps them know uh, how many people are attending, what sessions, and what was popular. Um, if you don't have it, you should download it. Um, it's it's uh, very helpful. Uh, make sure that you rate the session, um, and that will automatically enter you uh, to win uh, $250. So our, tar our target topics for this session, um, when we were trying to evaluate really leading into making the decision, third-party logistics, or trying to handle all of your distribution in-house, um, first we wanted to highlight some of the different consumer expectations and market trends um, that have been very prevalent. Um, and, and from a lot of those expectations and trends, um, the the technology that's really proliferated um, out of the emergence of a lot of those trends. Um, so we're going we're gonna to touch just briefly on those two uh, key topics as we then move into the various criteria that needs to go into place, um, the various considerations if you're looking at in-source in versus outsource, and um, some of the pros and cons of that. Consumer expectations and market trends. Um, so we, we the, the consumer expectations are, are constantly changing, and we there's you know dozens and dozens of different consumer expectations that we could have put up here. Um, we tried to hone in on on six key ones that we felt like were were some of the the biggest, um, the ones that were were likely impacting the technology and stuff that's within the warehouse the most. Um, and as we go through these six, we've tried to you know, create a little icon, a little logo that really represents each one. And then as we move into the technology section, we've included those same, those same logos just to kind of tie the two together. So you can really, uh, we want, really wanted to emphasize which uh, expectation or market trend um, led to the emergence of that technology, or the at least the proliferation of that technology within the warehouse. Uh, so the first one here is, is really speed. So two-day shipping is the norm. Um, people aren't, aren't going to be very happy with you know one week two week shipping it's it's two days is is the standard it's it's the it's the expectation at this point um and really same day or, or one day is, is becoming more and more common um so this has been a huge impact on the actual technology that we see within the warehouse um as well as a lot of the it and, and other technologies that have to be in place from the logistics side to help facilitate that that rapid um that rapid receipt of 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 the product to the consumer um, the next one is P 
people are more and more comfortable with buying a wider variety of products online. Uh, 10 years ago, people would not be super comfortable with buying high value items, um, big items that they might be worried would get you know, broken or damaged. Um, so now it's extremely common. People buy groceries online. People buy you know, large TVs online. Um, so this has been a huge impact to the technology that's within the warehouse because you might have something as small as a micro SD card and something as awkward and, and bulky as like a, a rug. Um, that's very hard to convey and very hard to uh, fulfill that out of your typical e-commerce channel. There's extremely high expectations for what the overall consumer experience, experience is going to be. Um, how easy was it to buy? Did I get a notification as soon as it shipped? How quickly did it ship? Uh, once it arrives to me, how what was the presentation like on the packaging? Even though I'm just gonna tear it open and throw it away, well, what was the presentation like? Um, how easy was it to open? How easy is it to return the item? Um, so the, the expectations for that entire process are higher than they've ever been. Um, so just consumers are really looking for a great all-around experience. The next one here is the environmental impact. So, you know, keeping the environment in mind, people are becoming more and more conscientious of uh, their, their own environmental impact, and they're becoming more aware of it. So how efficient is the packaging? How efficient is the, the labeling? Was there a printed out marketing insert, or was the marketing printed directly on the carton? Um, so that people are becoming more and more aware of that. The fifth one here, uh, the Amazon effect, this could really be summed up um, just in general as, as market competition. Um, so it's, it's a very, very competitive, and um, Ravi Shankar, our, our keynote speaker, really summed this up uh, very well yesterday when, when he said that shipping is free. Um, now, it's, it's not free, but that's the expectation. Um, we will have an entire generation of buyers coming into the market that have never paid for shipping, and they don't want to see a line item that says anything about shipping. Um, it's free. So, so Amazon has really... Um, set a lot of the expectations for consumers across the board for what they're, they're looking um, for out of their buying experience. And the last one here, this is really just general economics. Um, so there's a, t a lot of economic pressure right now. Um, unemployment is, is uh, extremely low. We have clients in certain markets that simply can't find people. Um, and, and that is really forcing them to move to automate various portions that they struggle to see ROI in, but they just simply can't find enough uh, workforce depending on what market they're, they're in. So those are the six, six key topics that we identified, and Mike's going to take us into the technology, uh, technology trends. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> so we, we have a section on technology trends in the warehouse and why this is important in the in how in 3PL versus in-house decision, uh, technology trends and, and the things we're going to talk about are becoming more prevalent in a modern warehouse. Not all of them in a single warehouse, but key elements uh, uh, may exist. And this requires capital. It requires uh, operational expertise. And uh, th whether you have that expertise in-house, whether you have the ability to invest. I think that can be a part of the decision-making criteria. Also, these technology trends uh, help affect and address issues in the warehouse like labor shortages, uh, labor availability, high labor costs, uh, use of space, and even uh, all the customer service requirements that are new in, in today's environment. Uh, over the past decade, there's been kind of revolutionary technologies like Kiva and AutoStore and various uses of robots. And all of these are, their, their objectives are to make things less expensive to operate, uh, to uh, fulfill things faster, and uh, essentially use less labor. So first we'll focus on the picking. And uh, picking technologies kind of uh, or I'd say a, a major move there uh, is the application of AGVs in the warehouse. 
And these applications really begin with the lift truck. So uh, the modern lift truck manufacturers, a lot of them are working on ways to automate their, their manual vehicles. So uh, some of them have teamed up with systems integrators. Uh, they've actually merged companies. And what you have are uh, manual lift trucks that can be brought to full automation. Uh, this you know, obviously gives you higher productivity without the operator. Uh, because you're starting with a base vehicle and just adding the automation, it requires much less capital to implement. So it's kind of an, emer of an emerging trend that we'll begin to see more and more of. And it, th what we're showing here is primarily for pallet movement, but any type of manual lift truck uh, can be automated and will be soon in the future. Another AGV application is the use of mobile bots that move racks. In this example, they're moving racks. There's all kinds of robotic, uh, small robot applications where they're either moving cases or totes, or in this case, rack frames. And in the example, uh, this is similar to the old Kiva technology. It's adapted by a variety of providers today. And it, 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 in essence, gives you a goods to person solution in your warehouse for relatively low cost. Uh, it's less expensive than a fixed automation goods to person solution. It's more flexible. Uh, the downside is it, it uses a lot more space in the warehouse, so it may not fit every need, but it's uh, gaining widespread acceptance, and there are a number of suppliers like uh, Gray Orange and Gresenbach that are, you know, provide this technology today. Another uh, disruptive technology is using augmented vision to support the picking process. So as you can see, uh, the operator is performing picks, uh, taking items from a supply tote and depositing them into a, a pick location, which could also be called a put wall. And in this instance, the operator is using, a, there's actually a light strip that is allowing him to verify his picks with hand waves. But uh, there are other applications of the same vision technology where you might use an RF gun or actually a, a barcode label on the location, and that, that would make it less expensive. So it, it's proving its worth as a pick to light or put to light uh, replacement. Uh, it provides a lot of flexibility and application. And uh, you know we'll see more and more of this as uh, warehouses continue to improve their operations. Another example is an ASRS shuttle, and this example in particular is uh, perfect pick technology. And this goods to person solution has uh, robotic shuttles that traverse the rack structure, both horizontally and vertically, to retrieve totes and bring them out to a forward pick location where an operator will then perform picks and you know, place the picked items into order totes. But with this type of technology, uh, rates of as high as 400 to 500 lines per hour are achievable. So it's very high productivity and it uses the cube in the building, as you can see by the height of the structure. And it, has, uh, it can handle a variety of bin sizes. Next, we have mobile robots on a fixed grid. Uh, this is also called uh, Auto Store. And with this solution, you have mobile robots on an aluminum grid that pick up bins that are stacked on the floor. The bins can be stacked up to 16 high, so this gives you tremendous density of storage, actually reducing. It's one of the more efficient ways to uh, store product in a, in a goods to person solution. So here you also have the robots are bringing the bins out to a pick location where an operator performs picks. It's not quite as efficient as the shuttle system that we just saw. The rates there for this are in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 lines per hour. So you know, it's a little less efficient, but it's also less expensive. So uh, the next category we'll go into is flexible sortation. 
So what we're trying to do with sortation is streamline the picking process, and this involves the transport, sortation of sequencing, and consolidation of eaches. So when goods to person is not a particularly good fit, and, and, and that really means uh, as volumes get higher and higher, at some point you reach a, a, a level where you have to look at high volume sortation to address the, the needs. Uh, goods to person may be just too expensive. So the first one we're going to look at is cross belt sortation. The cross belt sorters have a, a belt loop, uh, belt that, a series of belts that traverse a loop and they can divert product into chutes which are then uh, fed to a, a packing station. Uh, the video is showing cases and, and then very small objects, kind of a range of product sizes, but this could be an each only type sortation solution and can uh, address very high volumes. It's similar to a tilt tray in operation, uh, very high throughput, uh, but it's a little more expensive, and it, but it can get you a wide, uh, a very high uh, sort volume and can handle a wide array of, of products types and sizes. A, a kind of a newer uh, technology we're showing here is called a T-sort, and this is involving small robots that uh, deliver product from an induction station, you know, similar to the cross belt sorter, you have an inductor feeding product into the system. Well, the same thing happens here. An operator will induct product placing units on those yellow trays, and then the robots will drive around and deposit the loads into the blue totes. So this sort system is, you know, applying robotic technology, little uh, AGV bots, uh, it's kind of a more flexible, less expensive uh, solution than the hard automation of a, of a tilt tray or a cross belt sorter. Another sortation uh, technology, uh, this, we're calling it a pouch hanger system, but it's also referred to as a pocket sorter. And this would function uh, the same way as all the other sorters. You have an induction point and then you have uh, where an operator will place units into those pouches, and the uh, pouches uh, can handle an array of product sizes. It can handle uh, non-conveyable products. It's kind of a, a niche product that uh, allows you to, to deal with, you know, basketballs, soccer balls, all kinds of odd, odd-shaped products uh, with very high productivity, and then sortation and delivery to a packout station. Uh, another is a sh the use of a small shuttle for each sortation. So if, we w if you think back to the T-sort, this is really doing the same thing, uh, but it's a little faster and more compact. So it's using a, a scaled-down rack structure with an induction point and then shuttles that deliver the units to uh, little totes that represent an order destination. It can be very high speed with sort volumes up to 2,400 uh, units per hour with a single operator feeding the system. So uh, next in our journey through the technology is, is the packout area. So this area is where goods are prepared uh, you know, for the end customer. So there are a variety of ways to ship product. Uh, this technology is an auto bagging solution. So it is giving you a ba uh, product in a bag. So the idea with uh, bagging versus packing into a, a carton is the bagging uh, material is less expensive. Uh, the shipping costs are lower. So in this uh, kind of optimal format, the, the equipment will scan the items or it'll scan the actual order quantity, and it'll form a bag that's uh, kind of custom fit around that dimension. So you're essentially feeding the items into a, a bagging tunnel. The bags are, are uh, cut to length, sealed, labeled, and then sorted for shipment. So this, this automates a very manual process.
Another uh, pack out technology, this is called pack size. This is more manual, but it, it achieves the end goal of uh, a custom box around the order that is not oversized, uh, reducing shipping costs, reducing corrugate costs. So uh, the reductions in shipping are due to the dim weight reduction. Uh, but what a person has to do, they, the system calculates the cube of the order, and then that cube is, fed, is converted into a box dimension. And the, the uh, machine, through a, a loop of corrugate, feeds corrugate to an operator. It cuts the corrugate to that ideal size. And then the operator glues and sets up the box for the picking process. And the carton is then filled. Next, we have a, an automated version of that. So this is automatic uh, carton forming and lidding. And what this technology does, it, uh, you, have a pre, you have a carton size that is fixed. And it, it, it forms the cartons, which are then filled by the, the pick, in the picking process. Once the formed carton is you know, filled with the pick product, the system can then sense how large, how much cube is used in the carton. It then shrinks the corrugate size down to that cube, and then it automatically applies a lid to the carton. So you wind up with a uh, kind of an optimal carton size, but as an automatic process, it's more efficient than the, the pack size option that we just talk, talked about. But it has the same benefits of reduced corrugate, reduced dim weight shipping costs, and you, but you can also, and this may help address the uh, presentation, you can also have the cartons pre-printed with uh, supplier logos and other kind of decorative uh, information to enhance customer uh, presentation and satisfaction. And lastly, we have uh, automatic truck loading and unloading. So in this, uh, this is kind of an emerging technology uh, it's just starting to hit some warehouses. It's automating that last step of loading the cartons onto the truck. This uh, tends to be, as a manual function, one of the least desirable jobs in a warehouse. Uh, hardest to you know, find people to do. It's, it could be heavy loading and not very ergonomic. So this type of a solution can provide uh, automation using vision and robotic technology uh, the rates, you, know, you, can, you can process at a very high rate, you know, up to 20 cartons an hour. It can handle heavier loads. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, an option for the future. So just kind of in summary, we've discussed a lot of technologies. As you can see, there's quite a few on the market. No one warehouse has all of them. But uh, uh, the, a new modern warehouse design might have several. So this... Uh, is really a key driver in how you need to operate a warehouse to meet customer service goals and to reduce operating costs. And the, I'd say the expertise and investment required for this is a key consideration in the, the next step, which is the insourcing versus outsourcing uh, decision you know, for your distribution operation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Good morning. All right. Okay, so insourcing versus outsourcing distribution. Um, you can outsource your entire supply chain to a 4PL or a 3PL, um, but how do you figure out which areas of your supply chain that you want to outsource? Um, you really need to have a strategic conversation within your organization. Um, and the, the topics that I'm going to go over, I've identified three key areas to help guide that conversation and some considerations on, and factors to think about and some questions to ask as you're trying to figure out that decision-making process. Um, so I actually um, had people ask me this quite a lot, so I figured I'd just... What is the difference between a 4PL and a 3PL? Um, so a 4PL uh, is a fourth party logistics provider, is essentially bundling services of multiple 3PLs and providing it to you as a one-stop shop. Um, you, can have multi you can manage multiple 3PL vendors 
or you can find that one service provider and they're gonna go out and if they don't have those services in-house, they will outsource them to 3PLs and then um, provide them to you. It really depends on your business needs, um, if you're interested in having more direct oversight over your vendors, or if you really do want that one vendor to take care of everything. Um, as I go through this, I'm obviously gonna be talking specifically about distribution, but um, there are 3PLs that offer services for your entire supply chain. Um, so this is just a little quick slide um, that 3PLs are very commonly used. 86% um, of Fortune 500 companies outsource to 3PLs in some form of another, um, and that is growing. So the first area um, to think about is operational. What is your core competency? Are you a manufacturer, are you a retailer? Uh, does your primary business overlap with the core competencies of a distribution center in terms of productivity, labor management? Um, even with the great technology that is available that Bastion just went over, um, DCs are still typically pretty labor intensive um, and require strong day-to-day -day management ensuring you're, that you're operating a safe, efficient, and productive facility. So does that overlap with your core business? What is your commodity? Um, what business are you in? Will you be able to train and trust a partner to handle the product the way that you would? How much TLC does it need? Uh, 3PLs are typically efficient by being able to standardize processes. Um, if your business is not one that's easily standardized, then a 3PL may not be the best choice for you. Um, if you can't feel that you can properly train um, and pass that skill set on to a third party. Um, alternatively, there are portions of your distribution center that you could outsource. For example, maybe quality control is something that's very important to you, so you outsource um, some of the distribution activities, but you keep the quality control in-house. We have uh, some customers that do that, and they have their quality people on-site in the DCs that we manage for them. Seasonality. Um, is your business highly seasonal? Uh, does it require a significant increase in labor? Um, I think everybody knows with peak season coming up for Thanksgiving weekend, um, we're actively staffing up. Um, do you have the resources and the capabilities to do that? Um, you know, e-commerce volumes can increase 10, 20 fold over averages. And can you effectively train the people that need to be trained to be able to meet those demands and still hit the service levels that the customer requires by getting your shipments out in, you know, one to two days. The next uh, area of consideration is financial. What are your future growth plans? Uh, do you need to have flexibility to scale up quickly? Or are, is, your, is, your, is your situation such that you're more mature and you're not looking to grow your DC network? 3PLs uh, can effectively and quickly get buildings. Um, they can also help carry the cost of an entire building if you're not looking to have an entire uh, footprint. So they can share those costs across multiple customers as well as flex building size for when, it, when you need it. Are you looking to expand your distribution network into other states um, or is it in a fixed location? When you're thinking about um, getting to customers quickly, one of the most common things that we're seeing is, um, and, and this is obviously still driven by Amazon, um, is getting to more urban areas and having um, DCs in more urban areas. So are you looking to follow that or do you want to have a more centralized distribution center um, and so when you're considering a 3PL partner, do they have resources in those places that you want to be? Um, or would, do you want to manage multiple vendors that might be more regional specialists? IT considerations and technology. So um, with e-commerce and the, the growth and the need for faster labor productivity, um, automation is really something that um, is we're seeing grow and that customers are interested in? Um, do you have the financial resources to make those investments? 
in your distribution center. Uh, 3PL can help provide that kind of financial flexibility. Um, they could put up the capital and um, then spread it out over the life of their contract with you. They could incorporate it into your pricing model, um, or they could spread it across multiple customers if it's an applicable um, technology solution that could be applied within a distribution center that is servicing multiple customers. Um, Another consideration um, with regard to technology is the technology that you're looking for, do, do you have expertise in that technology or does your 3PL have expertise in that technology? Um, the technologies can typically have uh, some learning curve as well as ongoing maintenance, um, which can be expensive to make sure that you are maintaining these high capital investments and you're getting your value out of them so they don't shut down. 3PLs can also offer uh, standardization of vendors. Um, they can reach their networks and try and get better pricing on supplies, materials for a DC that you may not be able to have because they're buying it for the entire country or they're for their entire network. IT capabilities. Um, uh, WMS, Warehouse Management System, is truly critical to running a well-run, efficient distribution center. Do you have one? Do you have the resources to design and build one and partner with a WMS provider? The right 3PL should be able to provide you um, expertise in that area um, if they're not providing the W, if they can't provide the WMS themselves. But a lot should be able to actually provide a WMS as well with their offerings to run your distribution center. Um, building a WMS from scratch can be very expensive. And then some of the WMS functions that are really critical to running an efficient DC are things that the 3PL should have strong experience at. Um, inventory management, um, are you doing a cycle count program or are you doing a full shutdown of your inventory? Um, in the modern day and age, it's becoming more increasingly difficult to shut down for a few days and actually count all of your goods. So that cycle count program is very important. Um, efficient order management and traceability and having the, your WMS integrate with your parcel carrier um, so that the customer um, can give you their tracking number and you can actually go back into your WMS and see, see what happened with that order. Um, and then lastly, making use of some of these advanced technologies that we've looked at um, requires a fair amount of integration with, for the WMS to the WCS, the WCS is the warehouse control system, um, and that's typically the functionality that your integrator is going to provide that runs that automation system. So um, typically there are messages going back and forth between these two systems every day, hundreds of them um, talking to each other. So making sure that you have a robust WMS that can support that as you move towards an automated technology is very important. And then lastly, um, taxes and payroll uh, as a financial consideration. Um, operating in different states and municip municip uh, excuse me, municipalities, um, tax incentives can be available for job creation, but then you also have additional regulatory burden with um, filing taxes in those states uh, and compliance varying by state. Um, and going back to that question, do you want to have one centralized DC to streamline that? or do you want to have um, multiple in different areas to reach your customer sooner, but it does add some administrative and regulatory um, costs. In addition, um, when you're thinking about financial considerations and making an investment in some kind of an automated technology, um, you might have a financial incentive to make that investment yourself instead of doing it with your 3PL because you'll get the benefit on your um, taxes for uh, capital expenditures and depreciation. Uh, the last topic I'm going to go over is a regulatory, and this is really um, from my personal experience. I operate in California, and so um, in case people don't know, California has its own wage and hour laws, um, and when you go to other states, people are surprised to find out that in California um, there's overtime after eight hours in the day, not 40 hours in the week, and things like that. Um, so depending on where you're determining where your DC network is, do you um, have the payroll systems to support um, those challenges? Um, where I work in, Cal in Southern California, I have a facility that's uh, under the state mandatory minimum wage, and then I have a facility that's under the city mandatory minimum wage, and they're not the same. <laughs> and there's also different sick time regulations, and the facilities are about two miles apart. So um, it is important to make sure that you're in compliance with wage and hour. That's a, a very, a very hot um, topic in the warehousing industry right now. 
And then lastly is really safety. Um, it's number one, it's paramount. Uh, you have to operate a safe facility and it has to be your number one priority. If you're not operating a safe facility, it's gonna get shut down. Um, so do you have the competencies and um, support from uh, someone in your organization to actually understand all of the safety regulations and requirements and make sure that you're in compliance with those. Um, 3PLs typically will have that support and be able to get a, a facility up and running quickly um, so that you don't get shut down during an audit of some kind. So um, choosing the right partner is a big decision and um, hopefully some of these topics and questions have uh, will help you uh, drive that conversation. Um, cost is not always the number one factor, so when you're um, looking at different partners, um, keep in mind that you, they might be providing you the lowest cost, but are they gonna meet your needs? Are they gonna run your DC to the, the way you want it to be run? Not all 3PLs can do everything, so um, going back to considering working with a uh, 4PL that will bundle those services or managing multiple vendors and really understanding um, what that 3PL is going to provide to you. And you also don't have to outsource all the activities in your distribution center. You could just choose to outsource some of them. Values. Uh, code of conduct and supplier rules are, are very important and making sure that your 3PL aligns with yours um, and they're, they're the kind of partner that's going to bring value to your brand or at the very least not cause you PR problems, I think as we've all seen um, in the past with various uh, customers and um, seeing things happen in factories in Asia and things like that. Um, and then finally, um, startup costs and the initial learning curve with the vendor can be expensive. Um, so really making sure you have the right partner in the beginning. Um, trying to move your inventory to a new, a new warehouse is time consuming and expensive and also will cause disruptions to your customers which you don't want. Um, the systems integration and testing um, is usually quite time consuming and expensive as well. So lots of, most of our customers are long term and really building that relationship over time is, is critical. So in summary, uh, pros of insourcing, you get direct control. Um, you're not relying on anyone to do it for you, so you can make your own decisions. Um, you have the potential for financial incentives with the job creation and capital expenditure um, and realizing those through tax savings. And then lastly, you don't have the initial startup costs or learning curve with the new vendor. Um, the advantages of outsourcing to a 3PL, you get some additional flexibility, scalability, reduced regulatory compliance and legal exposure. You don't have that payroll burden. All of those employees are theirs. Workman's comp insurance will be lower. And then um, there's an opportunity for optimization and reduced costs. At the end of the day, the 3PL is in the business to um, make a profit with this, so they're incented to be as efficient as possible and try and pass those costs on to you. And that's the end of our prepared slides. So we uh, are available to take questions. Yeah, I'd say it's for both. Sure. The question was, are these um, guidelines, qu rules for startups only, or um, could they be relevant in other cases? And absolutely, those could absolutely be relevant in other cases. Um, startups are, are particularly um, challenging, so making sure you're finding the right partner with your startup. But even uh, if you're midstream, you can always choose to bring in a 3PL to help support, and some of those financial, operational, and regulatory considerations are still totally applicable. Yes. Uh, the question is, um, is there any particular things to look at if you're trying to change from your existing to a 3PL midstream? Um, I would say internally you would need to review, are you meeting your customers' metrics? Um, what are your costs like? What's your CPU? Um, are, are there opportunities to bring those down or to, to have a better um, service level to your customers? And that's um, where I would start my conversation in terms of should we bring in a 3PL or not. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the question is, how do you handle transferring inventory from one warehouse to another or to a new partner? And yes, it is a, one of the biggest challenges is, is trying to um, change inventory. So it depends on your situation. If you are able to uh, phase down um, and then you can start receiving new stock into the new facility and then slowly ship out from the old and have you know a, a phased approach to it. Um, that's usually what we like to do, so it's not like some kind of hard stop that's gonna disrupt your business, um, but it is one of the bigger challenges. Um, and then eventually you would probably do some kind of transfers and with inventory control, um, what we would do typically with RWMS is we would drop an order and then we would um, create the load, we would invoice it, and then we would create an ASN to receive it into the new warehouse. The question is a revenue or a unit threshold. Um, and not in my experience. It really depends on your commodity and, and your specific situation. Um, and absolutely, 3PLs are not necessarily a great fit across the board. And there might be, you know, there are certain opportunities that aren't a good fit for us that we don't, we don't pursue and that might be a good fit for a different 3PL provider because that's um, more of their specialty. Um, Cal Cartage um, is a part of NFI, which is a large 3PL, um, and so there's much smaller niche ones that might be able to better serve uh, a smaller um, uh, threshold. Um, so the question is, how do you view the investment of technology in the confines of a shorter contract? Um, that would be a point of negotiation in terms of how we would structure the pricing and um, the investment. So there's lots of ways that you can do the investment where we could do it together, and you guys invest a portion of the money and we invest a portion of the money. Um, we have contracts where it's built into the per unit pricing. We have contracts where it's built into a fixed cost where the customer pays us back on, on a monthly fixed amount with a set interest rate that's agreed upon. Um, Although, if you are going to make a very significant investment in technology that's in, you know, in the multiple millions of dollars, uh, typically you're going to get more bang for your buck by having a longer contract. Um, however, we have a structure where typically if the customer wants to cancel our contract, they have to pay us back and they can move on. Um, so there's, I think there's flexibility there and it really depends on your financials and, and what you're looking for from the 3PL. Absolutely. So the question is, in terms of packaging and you have specifics, requirements, will the 3PL be able to meet those? Um, we have customers that provide their own supplies. And we use their supplies and they manage the inventory and they're responsible for it. Um, you know, so that's, that's absolutely, if you want us to use certain things, um, you're the customer. We're going to do what you need. Sure. The question is common pricing structures. So that is also um, variable and flexible. Um, there are structures where you will pay for the square footage as a base rent that you're using, and then there will be perhaps like a transactional on top of that. Or if you don't want to have that flat rate, um, then you would just pay, we would incorporate the rent and the cost of the warehouse into your transactional pricing. Um, it really depends on how much space you need and how consistent you are with your use of space. So at least in the market that I'm in, I'm in Southern California, occupancy is, rates are um, at historical lows. So finding um, warehouse space uh, right now is very limited and that's why we're seeing lots of our customers move out of the Southern California area um, as well as um, while that's advantageous for ocean shipping from Asia, it's not the fastest for speed to market from an e-commerce standpoint since the vast majority of the country lives on the other side of the Mississippi River. 
Um, there's also other options if it's your building and you lease the building, um, and then we just come in and operate on your behalf. Okay, if there's no more questions, thank you very much for your time and attention this morning.